Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. Uh, this pre-class video is on chapter 5 of Wolf Wolfson, the first three sections. The first section is rather general. It's uh, problem solving with Newton's second law, just giving you some general tips. Uh, the second section is on a specific case of objects that are connected by ropes and pulleys. And the third section is on a specific case of circular motion. And the question above is, why does an airplane tip when it's turning? So you can see the airplane there, and uh, it's turning, I guess the air, uh, guy is turning to the left, meaning that it's actually that direction is the acceleration vector, and he's tipped the wings. So the wings provide an upward lift, meaning a lift that is perpendicular to the, uh, to the wing. And in this case, what's going on is that there's a component, a horizontal component, of that lift which is towards the direction that the plane is accelerating and so it helps the plane turn. Okay so let's start by going over the problem solving strategy so it goes I D E A so first step is to interpret the problem uh, and you're making sure here that it's really Newton's second law which is the important concept so that's F equals uh, F equals M A where A is a vector and F is a vector uh, identify which objects are, are of interest and uh, think about what forces are on each object and identify connections between the objects. The D stands for draw a diagram so in this case you can draw a free body diagram for each object uh, and you would develop your uh, solution plan by writing out Newton's second law in components for each object so the X component and uh, Y component. And the way that looks is that you've got f sub x equals m uh, times a sub x, and f sub y equals m times a sub y. So Newton's second law is actually two equations in 2D. Uh, the E is execute your plan, solve these equations for whatever you're trying to find. Uh, remember that a constraint, acceleration constraint, is also counts in a, as an equation. And the A stands for assess. Assess your solu solution to see if it makes sense. Think about the units and special cases. Okay, so there's a lot of examples in Chapter 5, and we'll go through a few of them today. And the first step in an example is to carefully read the question. So a skier of mass uh, 65 kilograms glides down a slope at an angle of 32 degrees as shown. Find A, the skier's acceleration, and B, the force that the snow exerts on the skier. And it says the snow is so slippery that there's no friction. Okay, so that means that the normal force is the only thing acting on the skier, and that means that the force of the snow on the skier is just the normal force. We're looking, so we're looking for A, acceleration, and normal force. Let's start by drawing a free body diagram of the skier. Uh, there's the gravity acting down, mg, and there's the normal force acting up, uh, like perpendicular to the slope, and that's it. So uh, at this point also we know the acceleration must be parallel to the slope. Uh, so we can define our axes, tilt our axes, so that it's accelerating the x direction only, so that a sub y equals zero. So we'll draw the x and y axes like that. At this point, let's look at the forces. The normal force is just in y, so that's n, and the x component of normal force is zero. The weight, uh, you have to draw a triangle there. So the weight acts down. Uh, the x component is uh, opposite to theta, I believe, and the negative y component is, uh, is the adjacent to the theta. So sine theta is wx over mg. That means that wx, uh, x component of weight is mg sine theta. And similarly, the y component of the weight is negative mg cos theta. So we'll do Newton's second law now. Let's start with the x component. F net and x is m times ax. Uh, there's only one uh, x component force, and that's, that's gravity, mg sine theta. So we can solve that for A sub X is just G sine theta. That's the acceleration of the skier. So it's 9.8 times sine 32. Plugging into my calculator, I got 5.2 meters per second squared. That's the answer to part A. Uh, for part B, they're asking for normal force. So let's go to the Y component of the net force. Uh, is zero because it's not accelerating up or down. And that's the normal force up and the weight uh, component pulling down. You solve that for normal force, mg cos theta. Plugging into my calculator, uh, I get at 540 newtons, and that's the answer to part B. Okay, so let's take a pause here to see if you've got it. A ball of mass M is suspended by a string from the ceiling inside an elevator. 
If the elevator is moving upward with constant speed, the tension in the string is, is it greater than mg, equal to mg, or less than mg, or it depends on what the speed of the elevator is. So I'll let you think about that. Uh, press pause, and then I'll tell you the answer. Okay, so the answer here, if you think about the ball, uh, free body diagram of the ball, you've got tension acting up, and you've got uh, mg acting down, and constant speed means the acceleration is zero. And so that means that these forces, F net, in the y direction, uh, have to equal zero. So that means the tension in the string has to equal mg. Okay, so let's talk more about tension. Uh, the f top figure here shows a safe that's hanging from a ceiling by a rope. And there's a magnified view of billions of little atoms that are connected by molecular bonds, which are modeled there as tiny little springs. And the fact that this is on, uh, that all these little springs are stretched is what we call tension. And tension pulls equally in both directions. If you were to look at a very thin cross section through the rope, which they show figure B here, one little layer of atoms, there's an upward pull from the bonds above, and there's a downward pull from the bonds below. And so uh, that little piece is in equilibrium, meaning that it's pulled equally from above and below. Okay, so let's do an example using uh, tension. To protect her 17 kilogram pack from bears, uh, mass is 17 kilograms, a camper hangs it from ropes between two trees as shown. Find the tension in each rope. Okay, so let's draw the free body diagram of the pack, because that's the object of interest. There's tension acting to the left and up. There's another tension acting to the right and up from the two ropes. And then there's gravity acting downwards. And I'm going to just define, uh, let's, and there's our theta. I'm going to define the x and y axes just to be y is up, x to the right. And I think here we can just balance the y components of the forces. So the net force in the y direction equals zero. So the pack doesn't accelerate and the bear can't get it. So there's the tension. Uh, there's theta. Tension in the y component uh, is the opposite. So sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. Uh, you can solve for t sub y is t sine theta. Uh, now F net in the y direction, remember that equals zero, so it's balanced, is equal to the tension from the left string, press the tension in the right string, minus the gravity acting down. And I'm going to solve that for tension. So uh, rewriting that, it's 2 T sine theta minus mg, pulling the t's over to the left side of the equation, t times 2 sine theta equals mg, uh, dividing by 2 sine theta, I got t is mg over 2 sine theta. So it's 17 times 9.8 divided by 2 times the sine of 22 degrees. Plugging into my calculator, I got 220 newtons. Okay, so now we're in the section on multiple objects which might be connected by strings or pulleys. And so there's a couple of handy tips here. So first of all, often in problems, the mass of the string or rope is much less than the masses of all the objects that they're, it's connecting. And so we let's use what I call the massless string approximation, which is that if you've got two objects A and B, the tension of this string uh, force acting on A is equal in magnitude to the tension of the string acting on uh, B. And so we just call that T, the tension. Um, so for example here, a rope is tied to a hook that's attached to the wall. If you pull over here to the right with a one newton force, then the force exerted by the hook on the rope, is it greater than one newton, less than one newton, or equal to one newton, or can it be determined? Take a pause, make sure you got it. Okay, so equal to one newton. This force pulling to the, to the left is the same as this force pulling to the right. So the, the tension is the same throughout this massless string. If there's a pulley, uh, sometimes you can have what's called a frictionless, uh, massless pulley. And uh, what that means is that now the tension that's acting on object A from the string uh, is equal to the tension acting on object B from the string. So this force sort of goes around the corner and is pulling upwards on B, and it's the same magnitude force pulling to the right on A. 
Okay, the next helpful hint is about acceleration constraints. So sometimes two objects uh, move together. Perhaps they're connected by a rope that is under tension. So if this tow truck moves to the right by one meter, the car moves to the right by one meter. If it does that in one second, then its average speed is one meter per second, and the car is also uh, one meter per second. So they're going to have the same, actually, instantaneous velocity. They're also going to have the same instantaneous acceleration. So uh, because they're connected, they move together. A so the, uh, of one object is A of the other. That's called an acceleration constraint. And in this case, what we often do is because the accelerations of both objects are equal, we can drop the subscripts for car and for truck and just call them both A sub X, for example. Now, they don't always have to be in the same direction. Sometimes uh, if, there's a, if there's a pulley involved, then this string, since it always remains the same length, uh, constrains the objects to accelerate together. So in this case, if B moves one meter down, then A must move one meter to the right. And they'll do that all in the same time. All the derivatives will be the same, so the velocities will be the same, and the accelerations will be the same. The only difference here is that this is moving in what you might call the, uh, the y direction. This is moving in what's called the in what you might call the x direction. So depending on how you define your x and y coordinates, the point here is that the magnitude of A is the same for both objects. Okay, let's do another example. A 73 kilogram climber, so mass is 73 kilograms, finds himself dangling over the edge of an ice cliff as shown. Fortunately, he's roped to a 940 kilogram rock. Okay, so there's two objects. So let's put a sub C on the mass of the climber and a sub R on the mass of the rock. He's located 51 meters from the edge of the cliff, or the rock is. Uh, unfortunately, the ice is frictionless, so the climber accelerates downward. What is his acceleration? Find A. Okay, so there's two free body diagrams. There's free body diagram of the rock. Uh, so there's going to be the normal force acting up from the ground and gravity on the rock acting down and the tension acting towards the right. And this rock, I guess, will accelerate towards the right. <coughs> And there's also a free body diagram of the climber, so two separate diagrams. And here the climber's got tension acting up, the same tension, and the gravity on the climber, MCG, acting down, and that's it. And he's accelerating down with the same acceleration as the rock. That's your acceleration constraint, just A. Now the rock doesn't accelerate up or down, so if you think about the Y forces, they have to balance. N is M sub R times G. That doesn't matter in our problem. What we want here is to define uh, plus axis to the right for the rock and do F net in the X direction is mass of the rock times its acceleration. And the only force is just tension acting towards the right. So that's our first equation. Uh, for the climber, let's define uh, plus x to be down in this case. So if we do F net x uh, is mc times a, the downward force of gravity is positive, and then the tension is acting negatively. It's in the upward direction. That's equation two. So now we have uh, two equations here and two unknowns. The two unknowns being the uh, acceleration a and the tension of the rope. We're asked for the, ten for the acceleration, so we have to eliminate the tension. So equation one actually gives us that tension we're trying to eliminate, our mr times a. Equation two, <coughs> if you put the t over on the other side, you can solve for tension there as well. Tension is mcg minus mca. So now to eliminate tension, we set t equals t. Use the equation one for the left-hand side and equation two uh, for the right-hand side. And now there's no t's in that equation, so we can just solve for a. So we'll bring all the terms with a in it over to the left-hand side, mra plus mca equals mcg. Uh, pull out the factor of mr plus mc. Then we can divide both sides by mr plus mc, and that gives us a. And if we put out <coughs> plug in the numbers, 73 kilograms and 940 kilograms multiplied by 9.8, we uh, get acceleration is 0.71 meters per second squared. And that's good, okay? He would normally, if he's not holding onto the rope, be accelerating down at 9.8 meters per second squared. But instead, uh, since he's attached to a 940 kilogram rock, he accelerates downwards much more slowly. So I assess that answer as, as being pr pretty sensible.
Okay, section 5.3 is about uh, circular motion. So an object that's moving uh, on a circular path at a constant speed is not constant velocity because it's turning, right? So that object or particle must have a net force acting on it of uh, m times a. And the acceleration is v squared over r, so the force is mv squared over r toward the center of the circular path. So for this race car, for example, it's off towards the right here. If there was no f uh, f net force like that, then the object would go in a straight line. And so this, if it was this car, for example, and that net force to the right went away, it would go off the road. It would end up in the ditch. Okay, let's do a circular motion example. Roads designed for high-speed travel have banked curves to give the normal force a component towards the center of the curve. That lets cars turn without relying on friction uh, between tires and roads, so no friction. At what angle should a road with a 350 meter curvature uh, radius be banked for travel at 25 meters per second? Okay, so let's look at the top view, bird's eye view, that's a circular path of this car. Um, and there's the center of the circle and the car is going down in this view and there's that radius. Now it's best to look at this actually from a rear view um, because in the rear view there's the car uh, it's banked and there's that angle theta so um, and it's accelerating towards the center of the curve which is just towards uh, the right here at uh, v squared over r. Okay, so we're going to draw a free body diagram now of the car, but in the rear view. So in this case, the normal force is acting up and towards the right, the gravity is acting down, and there's no friction, so that's it. And the acceleration is towards the right, so we're going to define the x-axis to be to the right and the y-axis to be up. So in this case, a sub x is your v squared over r, and a sub y is zero. So that's why we define it that way. So uh, the weight uh, in the x direction is zero, the weight in the y direction is negative mg. The normal force uh, has to have, we have to have components. So those are theta, uh, sine theta is opposite over uh, hypotenuse. So the normal force in the x direction is n sine theta and the y direction is n cos theta. Okay, so uh, let's do Newton's second law. We'll start with the x direction, f net in the x direction is m a sub x. And let's not forget, a sub x is v squared over r. Uh, so and the only force acting in the x direction is just the normal, n sine theta. Uh, so that's our equation 1, would be the x component. If we look at the y component next, uh, f net in the y direction uh, is m a sub y, which is just 0. Uh, now that's going to have two forces, the uh, normal force acting up and the gravity acting down. So that's equation two. And immediately from equation two, you can solve out for the normal force is going to be mg over cos theta, which is sort of interesting. So we have two equations now and two unknowns. The unknowns here are the uh, normal force and theta. And remember, we're trying to find the banking angle theta. So we want to eliminate normal force. So you can solve equation one for normal force. It's mv squared over r sine theta. And we've already solved equation 2 for normal force, mg over cos theta. Uh, n equals n gives us that mv squared over r sine theta equals mg over cos theta. Uh, we can kind of cross multiply to get the, uh, or can, first thing we can do is eliminate the m's. Cross multiply to get the thetas up on top. Uh, then we can collect thetas on one side of the equation. Sine theta over cos theta is tan theta, you should know that. So tan theta is v squared over gr. And now uh, we solve that by inverse tan. Tan to the minus 1 of that is going to give us our theta. So 25 squared over 9.8. Find the tan to the minus 1 button in your calculator. You should get 10 degrees. So it's saying there that for a speed of 25 meters per second, if you bank the curve at 10 degrees, then you don't need any friction. Uh, so if you're going faster than 25 meters per second, uh, then friction could still hold you on the road, or slower, and friction could still hold you on the road. Okay, the last example I want to do today is about vertical circular motion. And in this case, it's a uh, roller coaster with a loop in it. 
So you're coming down the roller coaster as you're going up on the right hand side there of the loop. Gravity acts downward, the normal force is horizontal, so the car is slowing as well as turning. Up at the top, uh, the normal force and the gravity are both acting down, so it's uniform circular motion. So, uh, the Dragonfire Roller Coaster at Canada's Wonderland features a double, double loop section. One of the loops is shown here, and the radius of curvature at the top is 6.3 meters. Qu what is the required speed for a roller coaster at the top of the loop if the normal force from the track is to be zero, neither pushing nor pulling? Okay, so let's draw a free body diagram of the car at the top. We've got uh, weight acting down, and normal force is zero, so that's the only force. Uh, it's accelerating downwards towards the center of circular motion, v squared over r. Let's define plus y is down, so a sub y is plus v squared over r. F net in the y direction is m a sub y, so it's m v squared over r. And there's only one force, it's just equal to mg. So the m's in that equation cancel. We've got uh, v squared over r. Uh, equals g, so v squared equals gr, v equals square root gr, it's square root of 9.8 times 6.3 meters in this case, so it's 7.9 meters per second squared. So if you're going exactly this speed, the critical speed, then the normal force will be zero. If you go faster than the speed, then you need an additional downward force to give you that acceleration, so the track pushes the car downwards uh, if you're going faster. If, for some reason, you go slower than this speed, then in order to stay on the track, you'd need an upward force. And real tracks actually do pull the car upwards at Canada's Wonderland, so that's for safety. If this doesn't happen, if you don't have special roller coaster wheels, then the car will actually fall off if you go too slow. And that's it. I will see you in class.